What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on the founder and president of the Libertas Institute, as well as the author of the Total Twins book series. And this is Connor Boyack. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No doubt, man. I've done a brief intro right there, Connor. But for people who aren't familiar with you and your work, tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do. So most people who know me know me because of these Tuttle Twins books. Uh, we've, I think we've sold over two and a half million copies now. These teach kids the ideas of freedom and entrepreneurship, the dangers of socialism and central planning and all that stuff that they don't teach in school anymore. If anything, they teach quite the opposite. So uh, we produce that book series. We're making a cartoon. And uh, basically our whole mission is to empower families to have these conversations um, about important ideas that are lead to you know human happiness and a healthy society and uh, undo all the brainwashing that kids are getting in schools and the media. So that's what the Tuttle Twins is all about. Awesome, man. So my first question is why this sounds a little bit heavy for children. Um, so why do you think that kids need to be learning about these sort of ideas in the books? At so what sort of age are they aimed at, first of all? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've got books from toddlers to teens, but our core book series is aimed at kids roughly five to 11 years of age. That's how we got started with the books. The toddler books and the teen books are kind of newer, uh, but we started with these children's books. And your question is a fair one. We got this question all along when we got started, like, do we really need kids to be learning this stuff? But I think last year, especially, we've come to the realization as a society that our kids are hearing all kinds of messages from all kinds of places. The kids are getting, uh, you know, you know, A is for activism. And, and just in a, a school down the road from me, they were teaching kids ABCs and S is for social activism. Y was for yes, we can. Uh, J is for justice and all these things. Mm -hmm. So I think parents have kind of woken up a little bit to the fact that they can't really shield their kids completely from these ideas. It really boils down to how do you frame these ideas in an appropriate way? So our books are very simplistic. They're fun stories. It's not like we're sitting kids down with a textbook and being like, we're going to teach you, you know, the, the benefits of the free market. Like how boring would that be? <laughs> but, um, but no, through fun stories, kids absor absorb this stuff. And as I was actually blown away. I, when we started, my kids were five and three years of age. So we, they were pretty young still. And I, with my own kids, but then as, you know, other kids start reading these books and we'd get parents emailing us and telling us the same thing. Just mind blowing how young kids can understand these complex ideas. When you tell them through story, they, they can grasp them, but also they like the challenge, right? Like I think we underestimate kids and we feed them all this like silly juvenile crap about like, you know, Tom and Bobby playing at the playground and whatever, right? Like these stories that don't mean anything, but when you when you empower them to learn these adult kind of ideas, they they rise to the occasion, right? Every kid wants to be an older kid. They want to be an adult. They want to take on more of that excitement and adventure and responsibility sometimes. And so that's what our books kind of facilitate. Uh, but you can also meet kids where they're at. It's not like we're talking about complex economic theory with an eight-year-old, mm -hmm. um, but we're really just empowering the parents to say, you know where your kid is at, you know what they can handle, and so glean from this story, whatever you want, you can go down the rabbit hole and talk about all kinds of crazy stuff if you want. Mm. But if you want to keep it lighthearted, simple, then that works, too. I hear that. So would it be fair to say that the books are almost a sort of counter activism? Would that be accurate? Is that a fair statement? Um, I, I, I like you putting it that way. I, over the years, have been accused of, oh, this is propaganda for kids, right? And I say, well, hang on, what does the word propaganda mean? Like, it has a negative connotation, mm -hmm. and, and rightly so, but the actual word just means to propagate, right? It means to, to propagate information from one source to another, from one person to another. Think of like a, a water running downstream, the water is propagating in, in a certain direction. So, the real question is, where are our children going to learn from? Is it our responsibility uh, and opportunity to teach our kids and transmit to them the values that we believe in and the truths that we've discovered? Or is like society or the schools or the government somehow entitled to propagandize our child, to transmit their values to our children? This really isn't a question of 
uh, whether the child is going to learn ideas. It's a matter of whose ideas, from what source, and when. Mm -hmm. And for too long, I think parents on kind of the conservative, libertarian, free market side of things have, I don't know, like surrendered our children or delegated to the system, to schools, to whatever, to like teach these ideas. And I think it really boils down to two, I call them the two sins. They're the sins of commission and the sins of omission. So the sins of commission are like the propaganda, the, the bias, the, you know, junk that schools are teaching, white supremacy and, you know, everything is horrible about America and whatnot. So that's a sin of commission where you're intentionally like teaching something bad. But the bigger problem is the sins of omission. A lot of this stuff, entrepreneurship, the golden rule, free markets, capitalism, the world working together to produce amazing things. This is just omitted from school curriculum. And so then schools, kids, excuse me, are left to pick up the pieces from media or their friends or whatever. And they end up being very left leaning primarily because of those influences. And the parents are suddenly surprised. Our books are not religious, but I love this quote from a, a Christian pastor, and I think it applies. In a Christian context, he, he's talking to his congregation. He says, can we as Christians really expect to send our children to Caesar's schools and have them return home as anything but Romans? Mm -hmm. And so in a political context, you think the same thing. Can we freedom lovers you know, give our children during their most formative years and everything to the system that wants them to learn these bad ideas and expect them to not absorb those ideas. So we're really, I like counteractivism, like you said, it's really mm -hmm. recognizing that we as parents need to hold up a shield around our kids and create a, I'll call it a safe space <laughs> within <laughs> which we can still talk to our kids about these values we hold dear before the world and, and its tidal wave of awfulness comes at them. Mm. It's a really interesting concept because oftentimes you'll hear people say that children should not be indoctrinated in any direction, right? And there's a part of me that sort of wants to agree with that. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that it almost can't be neutral, right? I mean, I guess something like hard sciences or like mathematics could be totally neutral. But in terms of values, morality, right versus wrong, what works versus what doesn't, these, these sort of ideas. The truth is, I mean, it's almost a parent's job to indoctrinate their children, isn't it? Right? So indoctrination right. has that word, like like propaganda, right? It has that very negative stigma. Like you'll have some people who are, uh, say, anti-theist type atheists who will say, oh, you know, Christians should not raise their children, you know, to be Christian. They shouldn't raise them in the church or a Muslim shouldn't raise their kids and take them. And I'm like, well, no, I mean, if you're an atheist, you're probably also, whether you know it or not, you are probably also putting that worldview onto your children. So you're also not, you might think you're being neutral, right. but nobody really is and nobody really wants to be either. So on one hand, I sort of, on face value, I hear that statement. I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, I, I sort of agree. But then I think about it longer and I'm sort of like, well kids are going to learn something. They're going to learn something from somewhere and it should come from their parents and hopefully their parents are teaching them the right stuff. And, and like propaganda, indoctrination has this negative connotation, but it's root word, right? To indoctrinate, to teach the doctrine. It's like kids are going to be taught some kind of doctrine. Is it mm -hmm. that the world is awful and capitalism is evil and white supremacy is everywhere and we got to burn the system down and that's the doctrine, right? Or is it, you know, people can work together and we, you know, regardless of, you know, skin, color or whatever, we can have this equal opportunity of, of aspirational greatness and, and build a better world. The question is, which doctrine is it gonna, uh, is going to be taught? And is my child somehow... Um, should my child somehow be subject to other people's doctrine over my own? Well, it's it's my child. This really gets into a parental rights. And let me be clear, like I, I'm actually with you, like I waffle back and forth on this idea because I can very much see how we don't want to just propagandize or indoctrinate children. We don't want them reading Tuttle Twins books and saying, this is the truth, never question it, you know, never explore other ideas. This is really just trying to empower families to have dinner conversations that go beyond, hey, honey, what did you do today? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, what do you want to do tomorrow? I don't know. Right? Like families have reported to us and we all know it that 
conversations are very difficult, especially when you want to help your children understand the craziness of what's going on in the world and some of these bigger current events. And parents, largely because they're products of public school themselves, feel inadequate to talk about these ideas. They don't understand the economics or the politics or the principles of it. And so what we see ourselves doing and what our Tuttle Twins readers really like it for is that we're giving the parents as much as the kids some information and ideas. And at the end of all the books, we have discussion questions. So it's like, hey, guys, you talked about you, you read about this. Now let's talk about it. What do you what do you think about it? Let's challenge these ideas. Are there, you know, is it wrong or what do you think? And so we're really just trying to encourage critical thinking because we see in the schools, especially, it's just, this is the truth. Don't question it, memorize it for the test, regurgitate it and you'll get a good grade. And I really think that that is a harm to society when we're not cultivating in kids' minds these important ideas, but then kind of in this Socratic way, like asking them questions and challenging them and inviting them to learn more. Mm. How do you think that the school system got to this position, especially in the modern Western world where a lot of what I would call bad ideas, especially in the last five to 10 years, um, it's really sort of come to a head where you've got, I mean, you were talking about the critical race theory and some of these ideas around gender ideology, so on and so forth, things which... I mean, I'm I'm 34 years old, and certainly when I was school, even when I was in university, these things were not um, they weren't conversations, they weren't an issue, they were very much on the fringes. Whereas it now seems that every single institution has now become somewhat infected with these ideas and this obsession with stuff we really shouldn't be obsessing over about race and gender and sexuality right. and this and that stuff, which, yeah, people I'd say in the past, people used to obsess about too much. <laughs> and then we kind of reached a happy stage where it was like, OK, you know what? This stuff doesn't really matter. People are people. We can get on. We're different. But hey, cool. Great. Like you know, I thought we were talking right. about diversity anyway. Right. And right. then it's sort of shot past the goal and it's gone back to this level of like, you know, there will be someone who's indoctrinated into this and they can't see us talking as just Zuby and Connor. This is God. This is a black. This is a, a black man and a, a white man. And an oppressor. And this, <laughs> yeah. And there's the, there's this subtext and there's some racism going on here somehow. Right. And we now need to decipher where the racism is taking place. <laughs> and you know, right? like just all this like, weird stuff. I'm like, wait, people didn't used to. That's not how we grew up. Like people weren't totally. thinking like that. So why do you think it's uh Coming back to the original question, why do you think that these ideas have gained so much uh, traction? Hmm. This is such a multi-layered question um, that I'll try and do it justice. I, I feel like there's two two responses. The first is if we were to look at everything you just said and the critical race theory and, and this kind of meta weird woke layer that's been caked on top of our institutions in the past, I don't know, five, 10 years, I think the answer to that stems from this notion that our institutions of power, academia, the media, the government, have been very left-leaning for a long time. If you look at the teacher schools, these institutions that train teachers to send them out into the schools, they're extremely left-leaning. You go look at the curriculum they're using and the narratives they're promoting, and it's all about central planning. It's about we know best. It's about these people are ignoramuses. You need to go shape them into the, you know, rather than trying to uncover who they are and help them discover themselves. It's this very top-down command and control system. And the people who are attracted to the levers of power are those who want to use power right? It's the central planners and the statists. And now that the cultural shift has happened in the past few years, and this wokeism infection is spreading everywhere, you've got this latent potential, this system of people who like to use their positions of power to dominate and to impose. Um, and, and these are the types of people who have the personality and the disposition and the character or lack thereof to use their power in that way. So I feel like that's part of the answer is, is just this precursor of decades of uh, attraction of, of the left to these institutions of power and the teacher schools and, and so forth that create this fertile soil for activism within these once reputable institutions. You look at the media and the, you know, biased nature thereof, you have these activism journalists, uh, you have activist teachers. But I, I feel like we would, 
um, do an injustice to your question if we only look at it through the lens of the past few years. And what I mean by that is that who knows, but maybe in a year or two or five, wokeism will, you know, we'll get it out of our system. There will be a course correction. I don't want people listening out there to think, oh, if only we could go back 10 years, everything would mm -hmm. be great with the public schools and the universities and all these things. Uh, so to answer your question more broadly and, and, and setting aside even the past decade, my response would be the system is working, especially academia, the K through 12 and the universities, the system is working exactly as it was intended by its creators. You have to go look into John Dewey and John Goodlad and Horace Mann, the people who are the architects of the modern education system. They looked to Prussia, this very militaristic society, this top-down orderly authoritarian system. They came back to America and from America it spread to all these Western countries to have this conveyor belt model of school, this notion that Connor's child is a raw product and needs to be put on this industrial conveyor belt so he can be stamped and shaped and molded in a way that we want, in a way that will serve society. These were Fabian socialists. They were out and out socialists who saw the individual as a cog in a machine, as part of the collective. They were literally creating in America, and from there it spread, this education system that could shape people into future supporters of the state, future cogs in, in the machine. And back in, in the industrial era, you can see at least how that kind of made sense. They were trying to industrialize everything. There's actually a, a great guy passed away about a year or two named Sir Ken Robinson. He's got some of the most popular TED Talks. And he talks about this problem of industrialized schooling. He says, education actually needs to be based on the principles of agriculture, where you've got this seed with so much latent potential that if all you give it is soil and sun and water, you give it some basic resources, it will thrive into something that you don't know what it's going to be. You shouldn't try and control it. Let it do its own thing. We are so far afield from that. And so that's part of what we try and do with the Tuttle Twins books is veer back in that direction to say, these kids are amazing. They're pre-programmed. They have their own potential. We don't need to put our societal template or imprint onto them. And, and so to answer your question, I feel like we can't just look at the past decade. It's like this system was built this way to produce submissive, obedient cogs in the machine. We know it. We may prefer the convenience of having babysitting for our kids or, you know, free it, schooling or whatever. But at the end of the day, we know that government schools produce servile people that won't question the state and won't step out of line. And, and that's not an exception to the rule. That is what its creators intended. And in that vein, the system is a success, but that's not anything I want you know, my kids to have anything to do with. And so that's why I'm a big proponent of these alternative education models that steer away from that and have more of this principles of agriculture concept that Sir Ken, Robin, uh, Ken Robinson talked about, because I think it's so authentically human to how we learn and how we prosper. Mm. Do you think that more and more people and parents in particular are waking up to what's going on, especially as the indoctrination has become more and more blatant over time. I mean, kids now literally have social justice, social justice classes in some right. places, and they're literally learning about LGBT theory in elementary school, and they're literally directly being taught about white privilege and some of these racialized concepts. Again, that's really new. So do you think that's going to wake a lot of people up? I think you've got two groups. The first group are people who were already woken up, but they never got off the fence. Mm. It was convenient for them to stay in the status quo. Yeah, yeah, I know the schools teach garbage, but X, Y, Z reasons, right? And I've seen a ton of these people where COVID and lockdowns and all the you know, school shutdowns basically took these parents by the shoulders and just shook them and said, it's time to get off the fence. It's time to take action. They were already awake, but they were just kind of lazy and, and you know, uh, it was convenient. Then you got this other group that was totally inattentive to these ideas. And now their kids were over last year, right? They're doing like Zoom school or whatever. The parents are watching what's being taught. And then they're like, wait, what in the world? Like, why are my kids being taught this stuff? <laughs> right? They go to like the school board meetings and they're hearing like all the nonsense that's being taught. These parents are mobilizing and you've seen like fights across the 
you know, world, even the parents now like shaking their fist and showing up and maybe some of them are trying to get a, a good YouTube clip that they can then go share <laughs> online and have, and have it go viral. But nonetheless, they're active, they're mobilized, they're, mm. they're off the fence, they're awake. And so whether they were already awake or not, I think COVID and, and everything that the governments have done in the wake of COVID has mobilized a ton of parents. Here's my worry. My worry is that in America a decade ago, we had the Tea Party and it was very much this same kind of financial, like shake you by the shoulders and wake you up. And people were mobilized and we had protests and, you know, elected all these new people. But then the Tea Party died and, and things went back to normal. And so my worry right now, what one of the things that I'm trying to work on is finding a way to sustain all of the, the parental you know, awakeness, awareness, activism, so that this doesn't fizzle out. I don't want people to be like, oh good, COVID's over, we got our vaccines, let's go on with life and go on our cruise that we've been waiting mm -hmm. for. These parents have to wake up that this is a, a bigger problem, this is a longer term thing. This is something like our latest Tuttle Twins book is all about how the government takes advantage of these crises one after another. And so I wanna find a way to make sure parents don't go back to sleep they stay awake and they stay vigilant because this stuff is cyclical and it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a general observation I have, and I think this is largely due to people's personality disposition and also somewhat of the philosophy itself. But this is that people who lean more right, whether they consider themselves conservative or just right leaning or libertarian, etc., they don't have that activism streak in them generally speaking right if you think of activists you always think of you always think of left-wing causes right? right um in fact if you hear the term right-wing activist people's alarm bells kind of kind of go up right um if, whether you're talking about climate change or the free palestine movement or um, minimum wage any, minimum wage any social justice cause black lives matter feminist movement all of these things, they're all they're all left wing causes. The only more, I guess, conservative, you could say, cause that you really see people sort of going out for and being activists for and uh, that I see is uh, sort of the pro-life cause uh, yeah. in the USA in the in Europe. Not really. Um, but in the USA, you see that. And so I think by people's natural disposition, I mean, by by definition, if somebody is conservative, they're more conservative right they're not as likely to go out there and on the street and make some noise and right. you know, do this and do that and really trying to sort of push their position it tends to be much more playing defense all the time defense yep. defense defense and it's kind of hard to rally people around the concept of slow down right like that's not a great slogan yep. slow down take it easy <laughs> right so i think that's always one of the sort of chinks in the armor in a sense of what I guess you could call the the conservative movement in general, even li the libertarian movement, right? Because libertarians literally believe in, okay, small government, don't use massive authoritarian power, leave people alone. And whilst I myself am very libertarian leaning, I also can recognize that, ooh, that's sort of, in a way, it's a weak position against someone who is willing to use that authoritarianism or the force of the state threat of the government against you. It's kind of like fighting mm -hmm. with one hand behind your back because they're trying to take the ring and use the ring and you're trying to say, no, nobody use the ring. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> so I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's just, uh, no, just you're, you're dead on. Here. It's, it's, uh, the other problem that's very related to what you're saying, Zuby, is this notion that as right of center individuals, whatever you want to call yourself on that spectrum, we're very independent. We're very kind of rugged individualist, you know, we're anti-central planning and so forth. And because of that, you get this concept of cat herding, right? Like it's impossible to herd cats. I, through, through Libertas Institute, which is like a think tank, we change a lot of laws and, and do a lot of political work. We're always trying to build coalitions. Hey guys, let's work together. Let's do this project. Let's whatever. The left, so-called, is great at doing that. And whatever their perspective or their background, they'll unify, they'll consolidate and, and share resources. They'll work together on this mission. And we suck at that. We're awful at that on the right, right? We try and build these coalitions. Everyone's like, well, I disagree with that. Like 7% of the thing that you're doing. I had this one group once that I knew they were in perfect alignment. And their response, I said, hey, join us at this press conference. We're going to do this thing. And the response to me literally was, 
well, we may or may not join you. I'm like, what's with this non-committal like garbage? It, you know, like let's stand up, let's push back, let's work together. And uh, I mean, Ronald Reagan had the quote uh, all the time. It's like, you know, oh, man, I'm going to butcher it now that I try and bring it up. But he's basically sa saying like someone who agrees with me 80 percent of the time is my friend, not my enemy. You know, and, and on the right, especially in the libertarian movement, as a very libertarian person, I'll tell you, there's a lot of infighting. It's, it's oh, you don't pass the purity test. You're yes. not sufficiently libertarian. <laughs> Let's, you know, debate on, on Twitter for four hours about these, like, nitpicky, whatever philosophical. And look, I get it. It's fun. I've been there. I've done that myself, too. But I'm interested in changing the world. I'm interested in, in changing hearts, minds, and laws. And to do that, I know that my enemy is people who disagree with me completely and they're totally on the other side and I'm willing to look past the so-called impure libertarians but that agree with me 80% of the time because I know they'll agree with me on this policy or this project and great let's go work together and be united front but so few people on the right want to do that they don't like coalitions they like forging their own path and, and I get it it's part of who we are but to your point it also inhibits us from being proactive. It inhibits us from going out there and, and, and organizing and being on the offense. And so at best, we rally together defensively, but we're always negotiating how much territory we're going to surrender, right? It's like Republicans right now in, in Congress. It's like, oh, this infrastructure package. Oh, instead of like 48 trillion, let's just do 47.3 <laughs> trillion, right? Like, can we just negotiate down to that? Oh, look, okay, victory. We succeeded in like not mm. spending as much, but it's like, you guys are doing way more than you ever would have. And so this defensive posturing is, is we're always going to lose. You know, we know where this is going. We know where society starts sliding in a certain direction. And unless and until we're willing to go on the offense, we're, we're just going to lose. And I don't, I hate losing. Mm. Something I found really interesting when I found first found out about you and your books is I was like, okay, this is someone who understands the importance of culture. Cause that is another area where, I don't like using the terms the left and the right, but that's another area where the yeah. right just loses and seeds ground totally. Arts, music, mm -hmm. um, you know, Hollywood, movies, video games, so many of these things, right? And there are people who are, you know, conservative or centrist or sane liberal or right leaning or whatever in all of these fields. But number one, people are massively outnumbered. And mm -hmm. two, again, I think the like there are a lot sometimes I'll, t I'll talk to people and you know, more conservative leaning whether they're in the states or in the uk and they're like well you know we'll get them at the ballot box right we'll vote and i'm always like look, voting only does so much right like the culture yep. like where is culture and society going um i'm not someone who aligns myself with any political party but i'm someone who's very much involved in the cultural aspect of things i'm a rapper i'm a podcaster I do a lot on social media, et cetera. So I understand that that's where, that's where the change really actually happens. As uh, Breitbart said, you know, politics is downstream from culture. And I don't totally. think that everybody gets that message. It's like if you send your kids to some of these state schools and they go through this indoctrination process and then you send them off to university and they go through it to an even stronger degree and they're studying some social science or whatever, like they're going to come out <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to come out with like right. a certain set of values and beliefs, et cetera. And then, of course, they're watching Netflix and they're watching this series and they're watching that and that and listening to this music. And it all shapes people, right? It shapes people in, in different ways. But again, I think that people overlook how important the cultural aspects are. And too many people think, okay, well, I can just be silent and then go vote Republican or go vote conservative right. and everything's going to magically work out. And it's just like, no, I mean, in the UK right now, we've supposedly had a conservative government for the past, I don't know, seven or eight years, supposedly, right? What does that mean? I, right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, I, I don't see what is being conserved. Um, and in the US, I mean, you had, you had Trump for four years. Um, and yeah, sure, I think he helped to slow down some of the cultural decay and social decay in some senses. Some people may disagree with me on that, but I think he did. Um, but still, uh, all of this stuff that we've been discussing, that's been happening over the past five years still. 
You're exactly right. And, and this is an issue that I think too few people on our site are willing to face. Um, you know, politics absolutely is downstream of culture. I'm a guy who's in, involved in both. I've changed dozens of laws. We're doing it across the country very successfully. But for all of the accolades we get and all the difference we make and everything else, I'm like, guys, we're putting Band-Aids on the dam. The, the water is bursting out at the seams and people are pissing in the river upstream. You know, like, like <laughs> we, we've got to go fix the problem further upstream because us folks working on changing laws, if society wants something else, if the culture is different and that pressure is there, then politicians will bow to that pressure. They will, regardless of what party they're in, what letter is after their name, right? The culture is going to get its way. There's a concept uh, called the Overton window in politics, which is like this on the, on the spectrum of idea between, let's say, tyranny on the one hand and liberty on the other. You've got this little window on that spectrum that moves up and down based on where the culture is at. And so let's say I want to legalize drugs or, you know, prostitution or I'm against mandates or, you know, lockdowns and things like that. If your idea, if your political idea to change the law or pass a new law or repeal a law, if it's not within that Overton window, it's called Overton because this is the guy that kind of thought it mm -hmm. up uh, in Michigan. If it's not within that window, it's not going to happen. If it's not culturally accepted, it's not going to happen. You look at like gay marriage, marijuana legalization, all these things, right? For decades, those issues were outside of the window. But then you had this culture shift. You had this acceptance of things that previously were verboten. And, and so that window moves. And all of a sudden, those legal proposals that people had been trying for years past never succeeded in the past. But now the window moves. And the culture is ready to embrace these ideas. The culture has shifted. We have to be involved in shifting the culture. That's one of the things that gives me energy in the morning waking up is because I recognize like you, like we all have our different aspects, the few of us who are working in culture on the right, <laughs> we have to be pushing this. We're One of the things I'm most excited about is with the success of the books that we've been doing for a while, we're now doing an animated cartoon series that's going to launch later this year. We raised, I think, 5 million bucks. We became... Uh, I think the second we're now the second largest kids media production in the world wow. uh, crowd crowdfunding that's raised the most money uh, in the world. And, and so there's just this appetite for what we're doing, because as we started talking with families, we're like, hey, you love our books. We have curriculum, whatever. It's like, OK, we're thinking about a cartoon. What do you think? And these parents are like, oh, my gosh, let me tell you about the cartoon my kid was watching the other day. You know, it's like Nickelodeon, <laughs> right? Teaching about trans whatever and pr mm -hmm. happy Pride Month and Blues Clues. Sesame Street. And it's like yep. all of these once safe um, media outlets and, and, and programs for kids that were agnostic and just didn't even get into the culture wars and the social stuff. No. They're now being infected and parents are so distrustful. They're worried. They're nervous. They don't know what to let their kids watch, what's safe anymore. And so that's why with the cartoon, like we're leaning into this culture idea because I, I think of like right now, I want to be planting seeds so that as these kids get older, what does the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years look like? Who's Who are the next freedom fighters for us in the next generation that we need to reach now and get them prepped? Because if we don't, they're going to get woke and they're going to veer off their path and they're not going to help us in the future. And so we're excited most by that. Like folks like you and others, we're working with adults, we're trying to persuade uh, you know, adult folks, but we see this also as an investment in the rising generation that is so needed because, you know, the quote unquote left, like you, I don't like using these terms, but yeah. you know, the, the statists among us, they're, they're trying and they're dominating the culture wars. And if we don't compete, we're going to lose. What are some of the core ideas that you propagate through both your Institute and your books? So, uh, they're, they're kind of the same. Um, you know, we're very big on entrepreneurship. The, uh, capitalism is ultimately service. People think of it as evil and dominating and Jeff Bezos is stealing the wealth of all these people. But look, when my package shows up the next day after I hit the order button, that to me is service. I don't have to drive down to the store. I don't have to get in my car. Like, you know, the guy that the kid that's pulling the weeds in my front yard, right? That's service to me, even though I'm paying him this, this mutually productive thing. So we talk a lot about entrepreneurship. We talk about the golden rule as the basis of, of human society. We should all treat other people the way we want to be treated. And that has a lot of political ramifications, but it's also 
just kind of this feel good issue that every parent wants to teach their child. Mm -hmm. And so that helps us appeal to people who are even moderate or left or whatever, because they can understand the, the power of this idea of the golden rule. We talk a lot about free markets. We talk about what is money. We talk about Bitcoin and crypto and all these things because, you know, what is gold? Why did uh, you got the shirt? There we go. You know, why, why did we get off the gold standard? What has happened to our money? Why did things cost way more for grandma and grandpa or way less? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. You know, why do they cost way more today? And so what is inflation? Um, so we talk about the law. What is justice? What are property rights? Central planning, the dangers of socialism. And I should mention, just because I haven't, the shtick that we use for all of our kids books is we base them off of an original book. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, um, Tuttle Twins and the Food Truck Fiasco is based off a book by Henry Hazlitt written a few decades ago called Economics in One Lesson. Or we've got The Road to Serfdom based off of F.A. Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. Atlas Shrugged, you know, we, we, we take all these like core books, uh, I Pencil, which is all about the free market or The Law by Frederick Bastiat. What, what is law? What is morality, right? Mm -hmm. We take these classic books and we figure out like, what are the core few ideas that this book is trying to teach? We pull those ideas out, we wrap it in a fun little story for kids and suddenly the kids are being exposed to these ideas. But then at the end of the book, it's like, hey mom, hey dad, you know, if you liked this topic, not only here are your discussion questions, but here's the original book, go check it out. Go, go learn more as a family. Maybe you're older kids, right? Maybe it's just mom and dad, whatever. But we point them to these classic books that have been preaching these ideas for a long time. And so like, we're not coming up with these ideas. It's not like any of this is new. This is stuff that good, great thinkers throughout history have been trying to preach to the masses. We're just finding that we're, the kids can understand these ideas, but also the parents, they're never gonna read The Road to Serfdom. If you walk up to like Bob on the street and say, here's economics in one lesson written decades ago in this English vernacular that we can't even understand <laughs> anymore because it uses like multi, multiple syllables and big words, like he's never gonna read it, right? But if you say, hey Bob, cute kid you have there. Here's a kid's book, you know, read this with your kid. The barrier to entry is much lower. There's no friction. And every parent wants to read books with their kids. They want to teach them important ideas. And, and suddenly we've got the parents too. That's what's so exciting for me is like, we started this like, hey, with Tuttle Twins, we're gonna teach the kids. We have found over half of our readers um, have never encountered these ideas before. They, mm. they maybe consider themselves like they believe in freedom or they feel patriotic or whatever, or I'm Republican or whatever it is, but there's no substance beyond that superficial feeling of freedom. Public school never gave it to them. Typically their parents never talked to them about it really. And so the parents love this because it's a very easy way for them to understand these ideas as well. And then if they're intrigued, they can then go learn a little bit more deeper. So whether through our institute or through these books, uh, really we, we see the principles of human flourishing as free markets, right? Individual freedom, uh, let people choose for themselves. It's this very kind of libertarianish perspective on things. And so whether through our policy side where we're out there like trying to change the law, but more importantly, I think through this education side of really putting this investment in the future of our world, uh, we think it's critical that these ideas get out and that we shape the culture like you're trying to do because without it, we're lost. Mm -hmm. What are you most worried about that would happen in the absence of this? Oh, when you say um, that we're lost, where, what do you think? What does that look like? It, it looks like what you said earlier. We're on the defense, but if if those who are playing defense don't know how to hold up their shield and how to hold up their sword and how to at least fight back a little, then we're going to lose much more quickly. What does that mean? It means that you know taxes go up, regulations increase, the dollar's inflated, the purchasing power of our money is going to tank. Uh, central planning is going to restrict property rights, like all these basic freedoms that for us in America were constitutionally protected, but have been eroded, you know, in the UK and throughout Europe and elsewhere. It's like, if we don't understand these principles, if we can't uh, imagine this, you've got a neighbor and your neighbor starts encroaching on your property front lawn. He's kind of spreading out his lawn furniture. He's kind of extending things over here. And you're like, wait a minute, that's my property. If you don't know where your property boundary is, you can't check his advance. You can't push back and be like, well, wait a minute, go no further. 
Mm -hmm. right? He's going to be able to little bit by little bit incrementally move over. And because you didn't say no to the last time, you're not going to say no to this time. Pretty soon you've lost your front yard because you never knew where your property boundary actually was and how to fight back. So, so you asked me, what does it mean if we don't have stuff like the Tuttle Twins or you and others pushing back in culture? What does it mean to lose? It means that we'll never be able to stand up and articulate what our rights are, what our freedoms are, why we should be guaranteed these freedoms and push back. And, and I can't predict the future. I mean, I don't know what the next COVID craziness is going to be in lock. I never predicted last year, like never could have foreseen how quickly people could get scared and surrender their basic freedoms in exchange for supposed security. Like I, I never would have predicted that our society would have veered that quickly that fast. But at least there's the counter activism, like you said, there's the pushback, there's the parents out there reasserting and saying, no, this is wrong. I put up with it for 15 days to flatten the curve, but 15 months is too long, right? Mm -hmm. Without education, without culture, without understanding, you know, people aren't even going to fight back. And then we might as well just, you know, move to Costa Rica or something and live on the beach. And, you know, because we, we've lost by that point. And, and I'm, I'm most like, I can put up with it, right? I can, I can tolerate the restrictions and flying through the airport and getting padded down. And, you know, like I can tolerate these things, but I don't want a world where my kids have to tolerate that. Mm. I don't want a world where my kids don't even know any different than George Orwell's 1984, that they're just used to their chains because it's all they've ever known. That's what depresses me. Mm. And so that's why we're fighting back with the Tuttle Twins because I don't want to lose for them. I don't want them to have a bleaker future than we had growing up. Mm. It's really interesting. I mean, I think there was that I think it was a Ronald Reagan quote where he essentially said that every generation has to fight for freedom again. Mm. And I can't, that's paraphrasing, but I think that's absolutely true. I think that here's something that has really a lot of things have struck me over the past 16 months. But one of my conclusions is that authoritarianism is actually the default human state rather than freedom. Mm. Right which mm, that's something I've come to. I think freedom is actually anomalous, both geographically and historically, right? People actually being free and having liberty and human rights in the way that we understand and interpret them. I think that's actually anomalous and under any sort of pressure or fear or stronger power, again, we have seen people default back to authoritarianism, right? One of the most mind-blowing things over the past year hasn't just been that when people are afraid, they will tolerate authoritarianism. It's that they will demand it, mm. right? People, I'm sure you've seen that as well, right? People actually demand authoritarianism, right? People are trying yeah. to, it's not just that someone wants to wear a mask, it's that they want to force you to. They think that the state should force you to. They There's people who don't just want to have their vaccines or whatever. They want to force other people to, right? They're, they're the ones who are demanding the authoritarianism. And another thing that's also been really enlightening, looking at this around the world, is that a lot of so-called progressives, um, they shift to some pretty far-right positions very quickly under the pressure of fear. Right. Look at the places with the hardest and strictest and most draconian measures to deal with this. A lot of them are places like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, parts of the UK and Western Europe. Right. And then you look at places which are we typically consider to be more openly authoritarian, shall we say. And there's more freedom there. That's weird. <laughs> right. It's been one of the most amazing things for me to just sort of watch. Disturbing in many ways. But I'm just there like, wow, I'm looking at different countries and the way they're handling it. And I'm like, geez, like Canada is the country that's looking far right right now. New Zealand is looking pretty far right authority, right? They shut out their borders. You can't go out. You can't come Crazy. in, right? Like the same people who are like open borders. Yeah, come on, right? All of us, <laughs> right? You know, Justin Trudeau, all of a sudden it's like, nope, like Canada is locked. <laughs> Canada is locked. I'm just like, that's so fascinating to me. It's really, really There's a great quote from Thomas Jefferson I love, and I, I think it encapsulates this kind of assessment that you've done about the past 16 months. He says, uh, timid men, of course, women as well, but back then it was only the men and white men, apparently. <laughs> timid men prefer the calm of despotism to the tempestuous sea of liberty. People go. prefer 
despotism and its its purported calm. I think that's also important to point out that the yes. calm of despotism, the security that we trade our liberty for, is never actually secure, right? TSA, right, flying, you know, like they don't keep us any more secure. It's all security theater, but it's this purported calm of despotism that hides and masks all of the destruction and suppression of free will and, and joy that's necessary for despotism to exist. And so you have this calm of despotism that people prefer as opposed to the clearly tempestuous sea of liberty, right? Frederick Bastiat talked about how good, bad economists will see only that which is seen. They can observe, oh, like, look, this, you know, fire burned down, therefore they have to rebuild the home. And that's good because that'll create jobs, right? It's good when fires burn homes down. Uh, but good economists, he said, also focus on that which is not seen. You have to understand that like those resources, had the home not been burned down, could have been employed elsewhere. But you have bad economists everywhere who just have tunnel vision and they see these acute effects. So people look at the sea of liberty, what it would be like if people could make decisions for their own life, whether to wear a mask, whether to go to work, whether to write and preach and say whatever they think and feel. And you look at that and you see that that's tempestuous. And, and so these bad economists, these, these statists, they look at that narrowly and they're like, oh my gosh, that's unpredictable. We can't control people that way. That's, that's bad things can happen. Alex Jones might say something crazy on the internet, right? But what they don't see is all the things behind it. Uh, these bad economists, they don't see what liberty produces and the productivity and the prosperity and the happiness that are produced through that tempestuous sea of liberty. It doesn't mean that liberty is safe. It doesn't mean people won't drown and bad things won't happen. Of course, that's what happens when you have freedom. But when you trade liberty for security, when you abandon the tempestuous sea of liberty in hopes of having this calm of despotism, you just have destruction. You have you know, evil. You have immorality. You have virtue signaling of this, this superficial society that, that projects goodness when underneath it's just rotten to the core. Mm -hmm. No, I think you nailed it there, man. I think something that people also misunderstand is, I think when people think of the concept of tyranny or authoritarianism or totalitarianism, they always think it's going to come under the guise of that, right? They don't mm. realize it's going to come under the guise of security. It's going to come under the guise yeah. of safety. It's going to come under the guise of, hey, we're just trying to keep you safe and protect you, All right? That's how it's sold, it's not sold as, oh, we just want to control you and take over <laughs> you. So, uh, no, right? These people aren't stupid. Right? <laughs> and right. so I think that that allows that totalitarian tiptoe like we've seen again over the past 16 mm. months because everyone's just like, oh my gosh, like this is to protect us. Like this is to be safe. You know what they keep saying? Be safe, stay home, protect lives, stay home, save lives. It's all protection, safety, security, protection, safety, security. Look after, we're looking after you. You look after that. That's how it's sold, the greater good, right? That's always how right. it's sold. And I don't think people, if someone like myself or yourself is, you know, sounding, sounding warning bells, people are like, oh, you guys are crazy, right? This is just about safety and health and security and whatever. And we're both like, mm, it might not be, guys. Like, this story has happened before, right? Just in different yeah. in different ways. So I think that because people are not really vigilant on that and perhaps they're not aware of how some of these things happen around the world and throughout history, they don't see that this guise of safety and security is actually – an authoritarian's greatest tool and tactic because it's really hard to argue about against the concept of uh, safety and security or public health. Zuby, before we wrap up, I, I feel to expand on what you just said. You said earlier that freedom is anomalous. Mm. And then here you're talking about how, uh, if I were to encapsulate it in a quote that most of your listeners know, and probably you as well, those who don't learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And the problem that we face, the thing that motivates me with our Tuttle Twins project is that kids today are not taught to learn from the past. They are merely taught about the past, right? It's like they're walking in a museum. And they're like, oh, look, those things happened hundreds of years ago. How, how interesting, right? And, and, and there's no relevance to their lives. There's no applicability. They don't understand why what happened in America in 1776, for example, has any relevance to the world, let alone America you know, in, in 2021. And so one of the things that we're working on over the next year is a, a history book 
that basically walks through those lessons of the past to try and help kids understand and apply them today because I agree with you, freedom is anomalous. There was something really interesting about these guys and everything they were studying and what they were trying to do to set up this system to create maximum prosperity, to limit government. You know, they weren't perfect. They made all kinds of mistakes. And yet there were so many interesting things that were done then that have absolute relevance to our lives today. And so if we don't want freedom to be anomalous in the sense that it happened one time a long, long time ago, right? Like I'd love to repeat that anomaly. And, and so if we want to have freedom again, we have to learn from the past, not just about the past, not, oh, who said what in 1740, whatever, and this, like, who cares, right? It, we have to learn the ideas, the philosophy, even the economics. We have to understand the principles. That's the what we have to learn from the past. Um, so as not to repeat it again, you're exactly right. Totalitarianism is not going to be wrapped in this cloak of, you know, daggers and, and evil. It's going to be <laughs> right. Like it's going to be wrapped in the flag, right? It's going to be patriotic. It's going to be like, absolutely. Yeah. The rainbow flag now, you know, it, it's going to be masked. And if we can't see how it was masked in the past, we're never going to understand how, you know, similar things are happening today. And so that's a project, this history stuff we're working on in the months ahead, because with, with, you know, whether it's critical race theory or whatever other garbage, the 1619 project about how America is built on slaves and nothing good came out of it. Right. It, it's really an attack on, you know, capitalism and classical liberalism and freedom. That, that doesn't mean that we can't talk about those controversial things. We should, oh, absolutely. we totally should. But that's but tough to you learn from and, too. Absolutely. Yeah. We want to learn from the, 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 the problems in the past so as not to repeat them. But anyways, that, that's why I'm so excited for the Tuttle Twins. I feel like it's been this gaping hole in, in kind of freedom loving, you know, families, having curriculum, having books, having any resource to help them push back against this narrative that is before last year was prevalent. And I feel like in the past year has just exploded and parents are bewildered and they're frustrated and they don't know where to turn. And so we're over here waving our hands as, as, <laughs> as actively as we can saying, come on, get the Tuttle Twins books. We're trying to help. So I just really appreciate being able to connect with you and your audience. I'm a big fan of your work and really just trying to change the culture, spread these ideas because we got an uphill battle and a lot of work to do. No doubt, man. I appreciate it. And where can people find out more about you and your projects? Uh, easiest place, head to TuttleTwins.com. That's where we got all of our books from toddlers to teenagers. Uh, we got all kinds of freebies if you order on there. So TuttleTwins.com is the place to go. Awesome. Connor, thanks so much for coming on the Real Talk, Real Talk with Zuby podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Put some respect on my name. Sick like a 